Our core mission is to help other non-profits. We do that mainly through tech, you know, technology capacity, social media, um, and comms and marketing upskilling. Most well-known program is the Donations and Discounts program. Um, used to be known as Donatech. Um, through that program alone, um, I think we've supported over 11,000 organisations and um, delivered a close to a quarter of a billion dollars in savings to the sector since 2007. But it's important to note that software and hardware alone doesn't necessarily build capacity. Nonprofits need to know what sort of software they need. They also need to know how to effectively use it. So increasingly, we've made investments into learning resources, how-to guides on our website that are all freely available. And we now have moved into providing webinars, training, conferences and things like that around the country. Connecting Up was actually the first non-profit job I, I ever had. Uh, before that, I worked in the corporate sector for EDS. Um, I didn't really know what I was getting into, but seven, eight years later, um, I've learned a lot through being, I suppose, one of the early social enterprises in Australia. And I suppose I want to share some of those um, insights um, today. Tracking back to open, opening plenary of the, um, of the conference, uh, both Tim and Peter spoke about how the, you know, the ethos and culture of organisations were sometimes at odds with the consumer, of what the consumer's needs um, actually were. And that was very much the case when I came into the organisation. Um, for us to start the donations and discounts program, we had to take a sales-based approach. We had to market and communicate to the sector. I can tell there was some hesitation about the terms of sales and commercialisation and, and business speak. Um, so there was a bit of a, a change in the cultural organisation to accept that and embrace it. But I think when we get down to the point of um, you know, selling the story internally of that, if, if we can help organisations save money, if we can help organisations build their capacity and our enterprise is tied financially to that, well, in that, in that respect, our financial drivers are helping the sector. So it's almost like a cross-celebration. Every time we actually, you know, gained our own income, you know, and our own sustainability, we were growing our impact on the sector. So selling that story internally, I think, um, helped a lot of people um, get across the line. Positioning and networking, um, it's a big wide world out there. And Katie Up was you know, particularly lucky to have a, um, a CEO who had a vision for the future and a... Uh, he understood the gap that especially non-profits were having in regards to engaging with technology. Um, we tried a lot of different things early on. Um, many of them failed, and I suppose I'll go through a few of these now. And I suppose that goes to, you know, with any enterprise, um, there's, a, there's an element of risk, and we certainly um, had our successes and our failures. Early on, we set up a um, not-for-profit ISP or internet provider called Big Paddock. Early on, we had a bit of traction, but quickly the, um, the market moved. Um, lots of new providers come in. We got undercut. And being a non-profit alone wasn't enough. That wasn't enough value for our clients to stick with us. We also received a grant from the government, and you're saying receiving grants from government can sort of be a, a dead end. Well, in this case, it was. They gave us a grant to do I, ICT health checks and audits. So we go into non-profits, order all their systems, and then give them a plan on how to be more efficient and save money. It, I think it was quite a good program. The, the audits did work well. The non-profits gained from it. But then afterwards, it was meant to be a sustainable enterprise. Um, but uh, you know, a year you know, gone from starting it, um, the enterprise had failed. And I think it was mainly due to, once again, we didn't commit to, you know, marketing and communicating out to the sector as much as we should. But there are some good stories. And in regards to positioning and networking, uh, we have a conference called the, called the Connect the Up Conference. Uh, we launched that about, I think, it was eight or nine years ago. Now, interesting that we, we didn't really know how well it was going to go, but um, it was well supported by the government and corporate sectors from a sponsorship point of view. And the first conference we ran in Little Old Adelaide, um, the attendance, I think, was about 300. So for quite a niche subject matter, you know, technology for non-profit conference, we thought, hang on, we are onto a winner here. There is a need within the sector. They have a desire to learn more about how technology can help their organisations. And importantly, a position getting up on a, on a global scale is that, you know, we're actually positioned as a, a niche, you know, technology non-profit. We quickly, you know, and the CEO was able to establish networks around the globe. Um, we found lots of like-minded organisations just like ourselves, you know, technology-focused non-profits. And it was only through the Connecting Up conference that our association with TechSoup Global, based out of San Francisco, that we actually, you know, that we were their preferred partner in the Donor Tech program. It's important to note that um, TechSoup Global, based out of San Francisco, is our partner in the Donations and Discounts program. 
They hold all the key relationships with the likes of Microsoft, Cisco, Symantec and SAP, who kindly donate their products to non-profits. Yeah, a few failures. I think even those failures, you know, you know taught us a few lessons. And um, through that, we did the Connecting Up conference and it positioned us to where we are today. Well, risk reward. Well, you know, we, we did take some risks. Small business, it's well known that many, many businesses fail within the you know, first three to five years. Um, that's very much the case, I think, for any enterprise. I think both senior management and the board need, need, need to be prepared but for that. At the same time, you, um, you can do things in a lightweight fashion. Um, those failures, some of those failures I talked about before, they didn't destroy the organisation, we didn't have to fire people, they were lightweight they were the way they were constructed. Um, if, it's, if one of them did go well, we were prepared to reinvest back into them. So yeah, don't call you, put your eggs in one basket, and I suppose, I feel that risk-reward is the, is the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, without risk, you have no reward, so I encourage um, you know, all, all organisations to, to think about that profile. I know that's extremely hard to sell to boards. Um, a lot of boards are risk averse at best, but um, if they were, do truly want to diversify their organisation and grow, uh, there's, they're going to have to take some of that um, on. And I suppose I'll, I'll track back as well. When I first came to the organisation, we were 90% government funded. Uh, we were very close to uh, falling over at the whim of a government grant. Um, but we're now in this position today where we're 95% social enterprise driven. And I feel that now we actually control our own destiny which is a, you know, a big turnaround from you know, seven to eight years ago. Innovate or replicate? Innovate is inherently new ideas or new enterprises, and to me that's inherently risky. Um, sometimes it's um, nice to cheat and just simply replicate what others I are doing. I said before that we did network around the globe through an association with TechSuit Global. They also had partners in almost every country around the globe. Um, so in that regard, we had organisations almost the same as us, same mission. And they already had, their, already had their own social enterprises working quite well. I suppose, and also the fact that it's global, I think it actually helps collaboration. Domestically, there can be some competition between non-profits. I'm sure we're aware of that. But when you work in a global uh, marketplace, I, I think there's a bit more collaboration that can be had there. And so a few examples of that are, um, there's a like-minded organisation in Poland. They had a refurbished uh, computer program. Um, slightly different model to what's been done before, where they actually didn't have one supplier, they actually had three or four suppliers. So what they were able to do then was leverage a bit of competition between these refurbished PC suppliers, bring the price down, and then deliver the best price for non-profits. It's probably a year after that that then Connecting Up um, embarked on the, on the, on the um, same types of models, and now, as you may be aware, we have a, a range of refurbished laptops, desktops, even servers and switches, etc. Um, another one was um, N10, a, um, a large um, te technology focused nonprofit based in um, America. They also ran run a conference like ours. Um, it's actually almost exactly the same as the Connecting Up conference, a tech for nonprofits conference. Um, gets around about, I think, you know, 12 to 1300 delegates a year. We do like to rub it in though, you know, when you look at the per capita ratings, if we're getting 400 to our conference, I think we're, um, we're winning on that regard. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, their conference alone, though, what's important there is that theirs just wasn't one conference a year. They, they had workshops, they had webinars, they had training. Every week they had something going on. So we think, think to myself, yeah, well, hang on, yeah, we're only doing one conference a year. We're not really meeting the needs of the sector. We, we've gone out and asked them what do they need more of. They need more training and technology. So once again, we met with N10. They told us their model, their pricing structures, how it works, how they effectively communicate and market this social enterprise. And once again, we replicated it again. So in, in many respects, I, I don't think we always need to innovate. There are really good models out there. And I'm not just talking in the non-profit sector, that's also in the for-profit sector. You know, look, look beyond um, your organisation for, for new ideas and, and um, replicate where possible. Even Catch of the Day, which um, unfortunately turns up on my credit card statement quite a bit, that was completely replicated on a US model. You know, Catch of the Day is, is not an innovation in the Australian economy, it's a complete replication. But as you know, it's doing quite well. You've alluded to this before, uh, is that you, know, you wouldn't get a plumber to, to fix a broken arm. And regardless to running a social enterprise, to me it's inherently a business, and I think you did need these acumen skills in your organisation. Um, if you don't have them, you can, you've got a few options there, you can obviously upskill them. But I must say, since 2007, the majority of staff that Connecting Up has employed have not necessarily come from the non-profit sector. They've come from, you know, they've been entrepreneurial, they've been people who have operated businesses themselves, or they've worked in customer service orientated positions in a, in a business environment. You might say, well, hang on, they might change the whole culture of the organisation and it will turn into this capitalist market-based market -based non-profit. 
Um, from my experience, when you do get people into a non-profit organisation and they learn that they're doing more than just, just making a buck, there's, um, yeah, it's, a bit, it's very addictive. I can certainly speak to and, you know, seven, eight years ago, I didn't know, know what the non-profit sector was. I thought the charity was just something you, you gave money to. But now, seven, eight years on, it's ingrained into who I am as a person. I can't imagine ever not being involved in the non-profit sector in some capacity moving forward. So, and I feel that's the same with a lot of the um, people we've brought into the organisation. Competition in the market. Uh, when it comes to the best people, when it comes to pricing, when it comes to marketing, you are competing in a competitive marketplace. When does it succeed, you need to compete, which can be somewhat different in, in regards to some of the non-profits uh, I do see out there. Uh, need to approach it like a business. As an example, with our refurb computer program, well, where we, we compete with lots of commercial providers and we're really competing on price. And we have to be really cutthroat in that regard. As a non-profit, we do have advantages. We do have strengths. Um, that's pretty much anyone. Um, there's two products. They're exactly the same. Same size, same price, same benefits. One's delivered by a for-profit organisation. One's delivered by an organisation that is for purpose or has a mission. Um, just like the Thank You Water, the success of Thank You Water. Um, if you saw, yeah, once again, two bottles of water, one was Mount Franklin and one was Thank You Water, and they were priced the same, <laughs> uh, I think it, it's pretty given that people will take the Thank You so Water. So to that extent, we have serious advantages there. And I suppose looking through your organisation, your enterprise, and looking at what other advantages you may have over the, um, the competition, whether that be that are for-profit or non-profit sector. Well, yeah. Some of our organisations are available to tax breaks. Some of us um, can get discounts on advertising through the media. Um, some of us are able to get donations and discounts of technology products and services through the likes of Connecting Up. And um, also, like, this opportunity is like Google AdWords. So if you're a non-profit organisation, you can gain access to, to free advertising on Google. Um, something a little bit interesting is that we actually advertise the Microsoft Donations program through Google AdWords, which is... I find it a little bit funny. <laughs> I think it's also assumed that people trust the non-profit sector, especially in, in our, we're sort of a business to business or a non-profit to non-profit. We do find that there's an inherent trust in non-profit organisations. I do hear every now and then, you know, you see something on Today Tonight about, you know, untrustworthy non-profit organisations, but I don't, I'm not sure that's the majority. I think when people deal with charities and non-profits, there's an inherent trust there, which is once again another advantage. And um, yeah, you, the, in your mission itself, it's an advantage. So your consumers, um, we do a lot of research into our consumers. Um, some of you may have seen some of the surveys we send out. We really do appreciate you filling them out. Um, that could be in regards to the use of technology in the sector. So we've run a, um, a sector-wide technology use survey uh, three or four times now. And importantly, what we've also done is benchmark that against other sectors like the small business sector or the financial sector. And so over time, we can see trends. We can see if we're actually having an impact or dent on, on some of the gaps that we see. And, but importantly, we can you know, learn more about our customers and their, and their, you know, their touch points and their pain points. It's a positioning, positioning tool for us as well. It puts us, um, you know, it makes us corporates and the government aware of, of what we're doing. But it's more important for us actually to know our customers and what their needs are. Uh, when I talked about the events and training, you know, how we replicated the model of N10, um, we didn't just re replicate it, we did survey our, you know, our customers first and asked them if they actually needed this service, what types of subjects do they want, how often do they want it, what sort of price did they want it. And that, that was actually something suggested to us by N10, maybe you should go out and learn, your, learn what your customers want. They may be quite different to an American you know, situation. Our, our research and our surveys and uh, insight into what our customers need really does drive our future decisions and what new social enterprises we will um, look into. Uh, and another example that we've looked into recently is doing a lot more looking at our resourcing, mm. especially in regards to customer um, support. Um, as the, as the um, donations and discount program grew, we were having to hire ever more customer support personnel. And it was becoming to the point where it was becoming a bit of a drain on the organisation. From that, we decided to create more of a self-help model. So a number of our clients now can theoretically answer their own questions um, through a help and support section. So the help and support section on our website is actually the same system that is used by our customer support personnel to actually provide support. So we actually call up um, a customer support at Canting Up. They're actually reading off the help and support section in regards to their response. Yeah, the important thing is that we weren't trying to you know, cut our resourcing here. We we're trying to realign our resourcing. So by doing that and being able to you know, take away our resourcing requirements and customer support, we were able to start investing into more comms and marketing, start investing into social media, start investing into providing you know, learning resources, how-to guides, etc. And once, once again, all of these things that I'm talking about further grew the enterprise itself 
And the further the um, enterprise grows and the way it's sort of tied financially is that the further it grows, the more impact we have on the sector. So to me, that's a marriage made in heaven.